Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast. This is the podcast that tackles tough questions about relationships, life, love, and loss. It may not be the advice you want, but it's probably the advice you need. And now here's your host, grief therapist, motivational speaker, relationship expert, best-selling author, and attorney, the not really mean, mean lady yourself, Susan J. Elliott. Good day, everybody. This is Susan Elliott, host of the Mean Lady Talking Podcast. And I apologize for the lack of podcasts last week. I've had, as you might still be able to hear, an upper respiratory infection. I had no voice or not a good voice for podcasting. I did record a podcast and it just sounded awful. And it's going to be part of a mini series that I'm doing on grief. So what I decided to do was when my voice feels better, I'm going to do it in three different podcast back to back to back on days that I don't normally podcast just so that I'm able to get it all together and that you can go from one to the other. Because one of the things that I did do when I was recording that was I kept talking very fast so that I could get all these things in and blah, 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 blah. And it's just too fast for the subject matter, which is grief. So I'm going to do right now is I'm going to attempt to get back to where we were last week. Um, So look for that. As soon as my voice feels 100%, I'm going to record that mini series on grief because I really think that it's very important and there shouldn't be a rush through of that material. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about was feeling so bad that you think that you're not going to get over it. Since I have been dealing with grief, one of the things that I am dedicated to is to educate people about grief. There is no other experience in the world other than being born and dying that we share with every other person on the planet, except for the experience of loss. We all have experienced a loss by the time we get to be 18 years old. It doesn't matter if it was your gerbil in the first grade, grandma in the fifth grade, your first boyfriend or girlfriend broke your heart in the seventh grade, whatever it is, we all get to adulthood with a scar of loss. We lost something or we even may have lost something to go on to something better. Like we left our old neighborhood to go to our new neighborhood because we can afford this new neighborhood. And it's a good thing, but we don't know enough to say goodbye to the thing that was good when it was there. But now we got a better gig and we're going to move on. You still have to acknowledge and honor the loss of something, even if the loss is because you're getting something better. People have talked about this for now a hundred years. Freud wrote Mourning and Melancholia in 1917. That was 101 years ago, and we still don't get it. We still don't get it. And Freud acknowledged that grief comes from something other than death. Even in those early papers, when he's exploring the idea of melancholia, which is basically stifled grief, grief that has not been expressed fully after a loss, in the early days of Freud and Abraham having this conversation back and forth about the grieving process. Freud acknowledged the upheaval that was going on in Europe at the time, political upheaval. And he said that the process of mourning can be applied to other experiences like the loss of the fatherland. Those were his exact words, the loss of the fatherland or your liberty or going back to the place where you were born, whatever it is. He said it can be an ideal, a situation. Freud was very, very insightful about the grief process, and he was not above revamping his theories based on things that happened to him. He used to say that the process of grief is a magnificent struggle between wanting to hold on and needing to let go. And what Freud said was, it is a process that is slow and it involves a great deal of cathartic energy. And when we talk about cathartic energy, it's actual physical energy that we have to express an emotion, whether it's crying whether it's wringing your hands, whether it's sleeplessness, whatever it is, cathartic energy, any energy that's being taken up 
because you are having feelings about a loss. That's cathartic energy. So over the years, Freud noticed that people had a horrible time with it because it is a very slow process and it does involve a great deal of expending cathartic energy. That's the central core of grief. It's a difficult, difficult battle between wanting to hold on and wanting to let go. And Freud originally said that the process of letting go was you relinquish the loved one completely. But then later on, his own daughter died and he revised that. And he said, it's not a true letting go. It's not a true relinquishment of the person. It's more of an internalization because he didn't want to let go of his daughter. And so he came to see that you hold on to the good parts. And when I do the mini series on grief, I'll go more into this because Freud was very, very astute when it came to grief. He really knew what he was talking about. And when I was studying grief and I was studying all the theorists that came after Freud and I was looking at the way people, other people evolved his theories. And other people took cues from him and said, oh, well, you know, I originally thought this, but now I'm going to think this. And I think that it was great that Freud would revise his theories when something happened to him. And one of the things that people know about me is that I don't ask people to do anything I haven't done. A lot of this stuff comes from the incredible amount of work I did in my own personal life to get right with this stuff, to resolve my losses, to do all the things that you you need to do in order to resolve your grief. So it was very, very important to me when I started doing this work with breakups that people recognize that breakups hurt. And many times people don't think they'll get over it, but you will. And you may even think of suicide, but thinking about it when you're in excruciating emotional pain is normal. You can consider it, but then you let it go as quickly as it came. If you're falling into despair and that's all you could think about. You need to get a psychiatric evaluation for depression. Don't let that scare you. You should have a floor under you when you're doing grief work. And like I said, a fleeting thought about suicide is normal, but it's not normal if you fall into despair and that's all you could think about. You really, really, really need to understand that you can get over this, but you need to understand that you have to be in good shape to feel the feelings of grief. That's just one of the things that is a truism about grief. Why I tell people, if you're really depressed and you're despairing, get some help, get an evaluation. The antidepressants will not take your feelings away. They will actually put a floor under you so that you can actually work through the emotions. Don't try to do this work if you're already depressed, if you're already despairing. You need to get help for your depression first. I have counseled people who have lost a child, people who have had their lives wiped out by fire or flood or lost multiple relatives in accidents or a house fire, or they had someone they loved disappear and never be found. I have worked with all kinds of families who have gone through very, very difficult times, very, very horrific losses. These are tough, tough losses and the people's grief is immense and intense. And it takes a long time to climb up those hills when the losses have been so traumatic. But these people do the work and they do manage to turn the page. They do still live good lives and manage to find happiness despite the holes in their hearts. They learn to live and to love around the holes. And they become heroes to others who experience similar losses and are able to reach out to them because they're still there and they're still standing. And that is something that I find so important to express to my listeners and to my readers. I've been through hell and back and I'm still standing and you can too. I have known a lot of people People who have taken these losses. If you've ever seen America's Most Wanted, John Walsh, he became a criminal investigator, a human rights advocate, a victim's rights advocate, and he was the host and creator of America's Most Wanted. He became an anti-crime activist. 
after the murder of his son, Adam. There are many people who do things like that. You can look at different stories of people that have had really difficult things happen to them. And like John Walsh, they have channeled it into something where they feel their life has meaning. And that's how I do it with getting past your breakup in my podcast, on my Facebook group, in my articles, in my books. I let you know I've been there. I have learned all the things that I'm teaching and I know what works and I know what doesn't work. And I've worked with people over the years and I've discarded things that worked for me, but didn't work for the majority of people that I've worked with. And I've included some things that didn't necessarily work for me, but it had worked for other people, a good majority of the people that I've worked with. So I do both my own work and the work that I've been doing in the field over all these years. I've been taking notes. This works for this person. This didn't work for that person. What I teach is the best of the best of the best. And I feel that when I think back on all the pain that I've had in my life, which was substantial, I feel as if I have a voice where I can help people who are broken by a breakup, who feel broken, who feel like they don't have any hope. They don't have anything to live for. They don't have anything to look forward to. You can learn to live and love around the holes in your heart. And you can become a hero to others who have experienced similar losses. When you heal your loss and you're able to reach out to them, it happens in the Facebook group all the time. There are different people on different places in their process. And as they get better, they start to reach back to people who are new and people who are raw and in pain and they can't see the forest for the trees and they can't think about going on without this person and they can't think that their life is ever going to work out. That's why it's so important as you continue on your journey to reach back and let others know, I've been there. You can do this. I say it all the time to people, you can do this because I feel if I could do it, anybody could do it. I had very large, very real, very substantial losses that I had never grieved. And I felt like the world was caving in on me. And yes, I did want to kill myself many times in that first year, many, many times. But I kept going for my kids. I just didn't feel like my kids would be happy if I wasn't there. So I kept going. And I became a power of example to people who went through devastating breakups. And they looked to me and they thought, how did you do this? Tell me how and I'll do it. And I said at the beginning that when I went to my therapist and my mentors and my sponsors and my this and my that, and I said, tell me what I need to do. I will stand on my head and spit nickels if I have to. If you tell me that will make me feel better, I will do it. And I call that the gift of desperation. When you get desperate enough to listen to people who are telling you, stop talking to your ex, stop feeling sorry for yourself, get a light. When you have losses that can't completely heal, the goal is to get over it as well as you're going to. There are many people who've lost a child who will say, I will never get over this. And that's probably true, but they can do the work and feel the sadness and the anger and all the feelings and get as far as they can into the healing process. And then they get out and they live their life to the best of your ability and show others that is possible. The end of the grief process is not acceptance like woo woo. It's not happiness. It's acknowledging the loss and acknowledging that you have changed, but deciding to go on anyway. Acceptance means you've come to a place where you've done the work and you know you've changed. You might always be sad about this loss on some level. There might always be a hole there, something missing, but you're going to go on and be as happy as you can be, even with that hole in your soul. Acceptance is an inner peace that comes from doing your work and knowing Knowing that the work has made you stronger in some ways, you're different and you still exist and you need to do more than survive. You need to thrive. Your heart needs to go on. It doesn't mean not ever feeling sad again. It means recognizing that there will be moments of sadness, but that's okay because for the most part, you're moving on. Acceptance at the end of grief work means making the decision to live your life to the best of your ability. You can't sit around waiting for the feeling to take hold, waiting to be inspired. You need to choose to move on and decide to move on. It's important to know that if you grieve this loss, you will heal and you will get over it. 
don't give up. As Freud said, the central issue in grief is the magnificent battle between wanting to hold on and needing to let go. The process is done slowly with a great deal of cathartic energy expended. And in 101 years, nobody has described it better than that. He called it the painful bit by bit letting go. And that's what it is. In the general scheme of things, in the flow of life, a breakup with someone you loved is one of the lesser losses. And it's one that almost everyone shares with you. There are many other losses that are unique. And when faced with them, people feel alone. Many of us have never lost a child or had a pregnancy terminate or faced infertility or had a house burned down and everything inside's loss, including loved ones. Or none of, most of us have not experienced a horrific car crash that claimed, you know, multiple relatives' lives. Many of us will never deal with some of those horrific losses, but every one of us will go through the break of a relationship and there is support, help, and hope. Things can be so much better than they were before. A breakup is a universal experience and everyone knows what a broken heart feels like and everyone knows you can get over it. Truly, you can. Please take the time to spread the message and carry the hope to others. That even if you're still hurting, if you've got hope and you're determined to see it through, you will be okay. Whether it's a spouse, a family member, an ex, it is, it's important to understand that a loss triggers all unresolved losses, which is why it's important to stop and grieve your losses when they happen. A breakup, as I write in Getting Past Your Breakup, is an opportunity to change your life. But the most important change to make is how you handle loss. It's time that you do start handling loss so loss can stop handling you. Unresolved loss becomes our greatest emotional handicap. Unresolved loss is grief work that has not been completed years after a loss occurs. One thing that I hear all the time and it's completely untrue and unhelpful and don't ever have these words come out of your mouth. Again, time heals all wounds. Time does not heal all wounds. Time does not heal the wound of loss. Repeat after me. Time does not heal all the wounds of loss. If it did, people wouldn't be bitter and angry years later. They just wouldn't be. And we've talked about the person who's always irritated in some level. This is a person that has not done all their grief work. They have not allowed all their feelings and they've become bitter and angry about things that have nothing to do with what they're really upset about. John Bradshaw said, give yourself permission to feel as bad as you really feel. And that's one thing you have to do because each unresolved loss will impair function for years to come. Dr. Therese Rando said that grief work that has not been completed is complicated mourning. And complicated mourning can lead to depression, anxiety, and other issues. Freud called it melancholia. And melancholia and depression are not exactly the same thing. Melancholia is more like a sadness, a despairing. It's grief and anxiety. And life just feels lifeless. That's melancholia and depression's on its way to melancholia. You don't want to get to the point where your losses are up in your face and you can't deal with it. You just become melancholy. You just cut it off. Unresolved loss can result in an inability to establish new relationships, to be fully present in your current relationship, or to end relationships and move on when the time is right. When we have unresolved losses, our life scope becomes narrow. We think we can't trust others to not hurt us. We become nervous about loving again. And this comes from not being able to trust ourselves to handle a loss. Once you know you can handle loss, once you know, yes, I can do this grief, you'll be okay. When I was early on in grad school, my adoptive mother passed away. And in her passing, I found an inability to move on. I was crying about her every day. A few times a day, I was having trouble functioning at work, at home, and even in school that I waited so long, you know, to get to graduate school. And here I was getting ready to blow it. 
My mother and I had had a tumultuous relationship and I was angry at her for things that I was unable to confront her about after she was diagnosed as terminal. But the whole thing was very baffling to me. I had years of therapy. I was in a nice relationship with a nice guy. We had a nice home. My kids, my dog, my cat, everybody was happy. Everybody was content. It was a few years after my divorce and I was thriving personally and professionally and I was fulfilling my dream of becoming a therapist. Everything in my life was coming together. My mother had been terminally ill for a while and I thought that I had expressed my grief and experienced my grief as well as anybody could. But I was mistaken. And in falling apart, I sought out a grief therapist and then I studied to become a grief therapist. For the first time, I came to learn about unresolved loss and grief. And though I'd done a lot of work in therapy, I had not really grieved many losses. And when my mother passed, the grief I did triggered all these other losses. And the losses were up in my face. They wanted me to tend to them. And working with my new therapist who was a grief counselor, I did exactly that. When I finally started my grief work, my moods leveled out and I began to respond appropriately to situations, events, and people. As I moved through my graduate program, I did my work in therapy. It always astounds me how many people are becoming therapists who have never been to therapy. If you go into a therapist's office, one of the first things you have to ask them is, how many years have you been in therapy? And they should be in therapy if they're a practicing therapist. I know that grief and mourning is not really taught to practitioners, and most of my fellow therapists had no training in it whatsoever, but I cringed as I watched their internship videos where they would take clients out of their grief. It was so obvious that the therapist was uncomfortable working with someone's grief or didn't know how to deal with it. They would say something in the middle of this person sort of having an epiphany. You could see it. They're going to have a catharsis right there on camera. I mean, this is what you want. This is a beautiful beautiful thing. You're talking, you're talking. And if your client is accessing their feelings and they're about to have an emotional breakdown, you don't say something and, and move them away because that's exactly what happened in nine out of 10 videos I would watch. They would see the person start to scrunch up their face and start to have an anxiety attack. And you could tell this person's going to start crying any minute. And the therapist interjects something. It's like, shut up, stupid. Take them right out of their feelings. And I thought to myself, you didn't want to see that client in the feelings because you haven't dealt with yours. And at that point, working with grieving clients became my mission in life because there's so many therapists and it's not really their fault because we're not trained to do these things. Read any. I look at social work, worker curriculum and I'm like, what does this have to do with helping people heal? I don't understand it. I really don't. And most graduate programs for counseling, for social work, for whatever it is, they don't involve grief at all. Our one universal experience other than living and dying that we all share is loss and nobody's teaching anybody anything about it. Why should they? I mean, they're only therapists. Why should they know anything about grief? Elizabeth Kubler-Ross called unresolved grief a destructive horror. And the reason that it's so destructive is that it lessens our ability to be present in our relationships. We become very guarded and unsure. We, we say, oh, we can't trust anybody again. It's not another person's job to get us to trust them. The bottom line line is that we can trust ourselves to do the right thing, to walk if someone hurts us. If someone loves us, we love them back. When we have appropriate responses to things, we can trust ourselves. Colin Murray Park said that as a society, we need to accept another person's need to grieve. And we need to treat it as a psychological necessity instead of a weakness. Many of us, even our therapists, are uncomfortable with our unresolved losses. So we encourage others to move on quickly. Way back in the 1940s, Eric Lindemann was studying people that were considered to be doing well. You know who those people were doing well after loss? The ones that were acting like nothing bad happened. We commend people. Oh, she's doing so well. Her husband died three weeks ago and she's all there bubbly buying lettuce in the supermarket. Yay, her. But no, 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 no,
not not the way to go. That's not doing well. Doing well is crying. Doing well is expending cathartic energy. If you've held back your grieving because you think that someone will think you're weak or they won't think you're doing well, don't let that hold you back. Many people tell us not to waste our tears on someone who has left us. Our tears are not for them. Our tears are for us. We need the cleansing power of tears to wash away our pain. Clarissa Pinkola SD said, tears are a river that take us someplace. We have to remember that. Our tears are for us. They're not for other people. We resolve our grief by allowing all the emotions of grief. But getting past your breakup emphasizes self-care while grieving because you can only work through loss if you're taking care of yourself at the same time. Remember what Freud said. He said, it's a slow process. It is the magnificent struggle between wanting to hold on and needing to let go. And it happens slowly by expending great cathartic energy. You've got to stop sometimes and you have to take care of yourself. That's the only way you get through the grieving. That's why I emphasize self-care over and over and over again. The only way you can get through it is to take care of yourself. Grief is a taboo subject. Even though loss is a universal experience that we all encounter repeatedly in life, we're not taught to deal with our own grief, let alone someone else's. We do whatever is necessary to avoid the feelings of loss, including running back to relationships that weren't working in the first place or running back to someone who's not good for us in the first place. We will choose the devil we know, which is a bad relationship, over the devil we don't know, which is the pain of facing unresolved grief. Psychosocial losses are losses other than death. They are seldom recognized by anyone and are not recognized as losses that require processing of feelings, but they are. If you've had a loss of a person through a breakup, you've had secondary losses as well. If you've moved and it's upset your life, you lost a job, you've had a loss that you need to grieve. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't. Too many people shut down their grief because they don't understand how important it is to work through the feelings and move on. Once you grieve your losses, you become a happier and healthy person. Neither losses nor the deep pain of grief will unhinge you to the point where you want to go back to a situation that is not good for you. You will learn by seeing this loss through, by feeling all the feelings, by taking care of yourself in such a way that you can take breaks from your grief and then you can go back to your grief and you could feel the feelings that is necessary for you to feel. John Bradshaw said you need to give yourself permission to feel as bad as you really feel. Give yourself permission. You will find that you will not stay in a situation that's good for you once you know that you can deal with the loss. It's imperative that you learn to recognize and grieve all of your losses. Once you grieve your losses, you don't need to worry about trusting others not to hurt you. You become aware of the fact that it's impossible to predict whether or not somebody else will hurt you. You could say, promise me, promise me, promise me. And they could promise you and the next day they change their mind. That's what happens. That's what people do. I've seen it over and over again. But you said, but you said, you promise. We need to not worry about what other people promise. We need to worry about what we promise ourselves. Once you grieve your losses, you only have to worry about trusting yourself and walking when it's time to walk. Welcome loss as an opportunity to heal that in you which needs to be healed. All the unresolved losses, all the unrequited love, all the abandonment. Use this time after breakup to heal all of that so that you may one day open again to a full and lasting love. You can do this. You absolutely can do this. You must do it. If you don't do it, you're just going to be in the same situation down the road. And since I'm losing my voice once again, I'm going to end this podcast here so that I can get you another podcast for Friday. And I apologize again for not having a podcast up last week. And I hope that you all take care of yourselves. And if you have any questions for Friday's podcast, please send them to me, Lady Talking Podcast at gmail.com. Everybody take care of yourself. Do your grief work, do your self-care work. Remember, you can.